David Viscott, and this is live, and I'm with you again. We have a very interesting lineup. Um, is there something going on on the planet right now, especially at this part of our of our country? You know, we had another earthquake this morning, a six nine out in um, Eureka, California. It makes you a little bit anxious to think that all these things are happening at once. I don't know whether you're having any anxiety about that. But living out here requires that you accommodate to these earthquakes. I was standing on a stage uh, lecturing to 600 people when the last one occurred. And the funny thing is I thought it was something I ate. It's funny living in California, isn't it, the way that happens? You adjust to different things. Anyhow, life is not always that easy to adjust to because just when you think you have your life worked out and you've got your job straightened out or your relationship straightened out or your relationship with your family straightened out, something happens. But the truth is, the something that happens, the something that happens always has to do with you. There's always something about a weakness that it reveals or some unfinished business from the past that shows up. The things that happen to make your life miserable are really part of the life that you haven't completed, the life lesson you still have to learn. And that's why you're tuning in, because I try to cut to the heart of that and point out that life lesson and free you up. Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. It's, it's Great. A, you having earthquake jitters? Oh, well, you know, when you're talking about how people adjust, I wonder, do you adjust if you're a native or if you're a non-native? Because I haven't adjusted yet. I'm not from here. <laughs> I don't, I think you would just right up until the moment everything in the room starts moving. And then forget it. And then it doesn't really happen. Okay, before we start, David, you know, I want to congratulate you for your Emmy nomination for uh, Best Host of a Local Show. I think that's great, you I, know. I, I think the viewers should know that. I think it's great, too. I got to tell you, I'm thrilled to be nominated for an Emmy. And if there was anything, you know, you know. Here I am, a, a little psychiatrist from Boston, comes out to L.A., and, and all, it's, it's really cute. So i got to tell you the cutest story, though. So I called up my, my mother. Stay, my mother's 85 years old. You should be in such good shape when you're 85. So I called her up. To, she's a, you know, she reads things. She looks a variety. So I said, Mom, I was nominated for an Emmy. So she goes, what category? What category? <laughs> Isn't that she crazy? <laughs> what do we have? Okay. We have Helmet, and we've talked to him before. He's on line A. Um, he's 82 and has finally had sex, but there are some problems. Helmet. Hello. Hi, Helmet. Hi, David. How are you doing? How are you doing, Helmet? Oh, I'm doing really good. Tell me what's going on with you. Well, first, congratulations. I just heard about your nomination. I think it's beautiful. Well, thank you, Helmut. Well, well, I just heard about some of your nominations, and they don't sound so bad either. Oh, yeah, it's not bad at all. Tell well, me. go ahead. What did you want no, to No, I want to know what's been going on in your life. Well, do you remember our last conversation? Absolutely. Uh, one of the questions I raised at that time, I think, was, was there any testicular problem? Well, I did exactly what you did. You told me to do. You told me to go see a doctor, I went to see a urologist, and then I went to see a neurologist. And there was nothing wrong with me, right. but they said it was a good point to have it checked because of the horseback riding. I told you I ride yes, with Yes, I my, remember that. Yeah, with my friend Philippe every day. But nothing was wrong with me, so I was very happy to hear that. Great. So what did you so, do? What did I do? Well. Mm. I, I kept going on with my life, you know, I'm not going to start going to clubs and looking for little babes and things like that. So. Good advice, Helmut. Yes, well, you know, it's very dangerous, you have to be very careful. I want all the young people to know it's very difficult now to meet women, and you have to be very careful with sex. But anyway, about four months ago, I went to the stable, and I have a friend over there, her name is Stephanie. She has a horse there, and she told me that she had a roommate. It wasn't really a roommate, it's a friend of hers who was staying with her. She came from Michigan, a friend of hers who's 45 years old, and she said that maybe we should meet because I talk a lot with Stephanie about my problems, and she knew that I was kind of looking for a girl, you know. I know. So, anyway, we went on, on the couple of dates, and... Guess what? Helen ended up moving in. With you? Yes. Helmet? Yes. That's great. Yeah, well, yeah, it was great, but it was kind of a shock because I told you I was married before and I'd been lonely for a long time, so have somebody in my apartment was quite a change. 
you were married and you didn't have sex with your wife? No, I told you that, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why the, the but marriage... The, but this uh, worked out? Yes, well, we had sex. Well, for, for the first month, the first month was great. We almost had sex like every day, sometimes even twice a day when I was feeling really good. Helmet. Hel helmet. Yes. You're an 82-year-old after my heart. Well, thank you. You ride, you ride horses and you have sex twice a day? Yeah, well, you got to <laughs> keep young, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm an athlete, in a way. Oh, God, go ahead. I don't know where to go with this, but I'll just no, follow. But, well, you, but is there a problem right now? Well, yes. Listen, it gets a little complicated. Anything. Because this woman has been lonely for a long time. She told me she had sex only a couple of times. That's what she told me. I believe her. Okay, and she's 45 years old. And for the past eight years, she had the only friend she had was that little dog. She yes. had a little dog. Okay. And when she moved, she didn't know where she was going to go in California. She was staying with Stephanie. So the dog was still with the parents in Michigan. So, uh, but a month after she moved in, they shipped the dog over, and that's when the problem started. How? Well... It's going to sound a little crazy, but since the dog's been here, I have, sex hasn't been working for me. Why not? I can't get an erection. The reason is, every time we try to have sex, <clears throat> the, dog, the dog is right there by the bed and he growls. Um, ship the dog back. Well, no, because you see, it's a close friend to her. Okay. It's very, very protective. I can... Everything that, well, that the dog why... Does. Wait, 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 wait a second. The dog doesn't have to be in the room. Well, it's Can't the very, dog be outside? It's a very small apartment. Isn't there a place for the dog to be outside? No, it's an apartment building. So, but you see, she treats the dog like a person. And I'm not used to that. And the dog is ugly. I love dogs. I love dogs. But this thing is ugly. It's Would ugly. it make any difference if the dog were adorable? Well, no, I don't think so. Okay. Does she know all of the problem that you're facing with him? Oh, yeah, but you see, if I say something about the dog, she gets very, very upset. Well, don't say anything about the dog. Well, Make I it... did already. No, no, no. Yeah, what did you say? Well, I said that thing bothers me. That's why sex doesn't work anymore. Well, well okay. But uh, the way to put it to her, come here, the way to put it to her is uh, to tell her, look, you have to understand that I'm very new at this. Uh-huh. And because of that, I'm very easily stymied. Yes. It has nothing to do with your dog. It has to do with, you, with me. And if you were to tell me to adjust to the dog, I'm still adjusting to having sex. Well... Well, no, you have to hear this. I'm still adjusting to having sex, you tell her. Listen, David. I, n I never told the girls that that was my first time. Well, you got to tell her. Oh, my God. Why not? Well, I'm kind of ashamed because I'm so old. Don't you know? worry. Hey, you win a prize already. A uh, what prize? B you, for having been able to do as well as you're doing. But what you have to tell her is that because this is your, f this is your strength right now, the truth about your first time, yes. say, you were the first woman I was ever with. Can you believe that? And because of this, I'm a little skittish and anxious about it. And when you bring a dog into the situation, I'm unable to perform, not because of the dog, but because of me. Right. So you, you, you make it her problem. If she wants to have sex with you, you can't be there with the dog. So another thing you can do is you, she moved in with you? Yes. We live together. In your apartment? In my apartment. Right now she's back in Michigan to visit her parents, but of course she lives. She left the little dog here with me. I uh. take care of him. I walk him. I feed him. But you know what? That dog is something else, David. Doesn't like he, you. He, well, he likes me. But whenever I'm not playing with him or not doing anything, he sits and stares at me. He's right here right now. And I'm sure he knows what I'm talking about. I'm telling you. It's something else. And that makes you very nervous. Extremely. Well, not, not really. Only when we have sex because he growls. And okay, I okay. very uncomfortable, and she's so overprotective with that Why don't dog. you get some dog yummies? You know what those are? Some what? Dog yummies. They're like little dog bones. Dog bones? Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, he's got all toys and bones and Generally cookies. speaking, dogs, yeah, but, but if you give him something terrific before yeah. you have sex, he'll be more concerned with his dog bone than your sex. Well, his sex he'd be interested in, but your sex he's not as interested in as he would be in a dog bone. Guess what? What? That dog eats every evening at 7 p.m. Okay. So one evening I said, let's go have sex while he's eating. He stopped and came in the room and growled. There is nothing I can do, David. I love dogs, you know. Mm. But she's like so overprotective. She's like a mother with the dog. It's you ha insane. Hey, you have to tell her that it's your first time. Well, I don't know what that's going to change. It's going to let her know that you're unable to compensate for the dog. Well, I Because don't know. you're still compensating for having sex. Yes. Okay? Tell her that. Trust me. Tell her that. And that'll work more than anything else. But if she knows it's your first time, well, she'll back away from it. I hope that the dog is still there when she gets home. <laughs> Don't even think about okay, okay, like that. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. You're, you're going to get calls on that. She said that. I'm I sorry. didn't say that. I love dogs. Go ahead. Okay. Let's go with Matthew. He's on line 12, and um, he has frightening memories of an abduction. Matthew? Uh, hello. Hi, Matthew. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How old are you, Matthew? Uh, I'm, I'm 22. Frightening memories of an abduction? Well, um, yeah, it's, um, well, I guess part of the problem was, um, uh, most of my life, I didn't, well, I didn't even realize it because I didn't really think about it, um, most of my childhood was, like, a complete and total blank for me. Um, like, um, I just remember, like, like specific instances, like Christmases or, or things, you know, of that nature, but... Most of, of 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 my past was a, a real mystery to me. It's just just I don't remember anything. And um, I'm originally from from a small town in Oregon, and I moved out here uh, a few years ago. And um, after being away from you know my family and and all that situation, um, and, um, and uh, what kind of an abduction are you talking about? Well, um, <laughs> um, um, maybe like like. Uh, like, like, like a UFO abduction situation. Tell me what you know about that. W what do I know about my own experience, or mm -hmm. just in general? Well, and how it came to the surface. Well, it's sort of like it, it's um, the way it sort of um, started to just come up was is sort of similar to like the way a person represses maybe like severe abuse, maybe. Wh and what did you start remembering? Um, I just started. Um, well, I started remembering that I used to have really terrible nightmares and they just weren't like normal nightmares you know they were they were just um just very different and sometimes they seemed too real and that was part of the clincher that made me you know start thinking that, and what was in the nightmare well um let's see um like some of the nightmares where i would um when i was a, a little boy and i was in my room and um um, um, um these these little people <laughs> These little people would, would uh, come into my room, and, and um, it seemed like they took me down into the basement of my house at that time, but it didn't seem like it was my basement. It seemed like it was something completely different, and, and I just remember there being a lot of them around me and, um, and just sort of um, you know, guiding me and, and manipulating me into these, these situations like where I was, like I was being you know, examined or, or just... Um, um, just, you know, a situation like that. Um, um, and and did these memories start coming back in greater detail? Yeah, in a way they have. Um, it's been very difficult because... Um, was there anything sexual in this? Well, um, well when, I th when I think about that, I think maybe it very well could be because I, um, I sort of get kind of paralyzed with, with like this, this real anxious fear whenever... Because, um, I've, I've, you know, these talk shows, it seems to be kind of ex exploitive of people who've had these experiences and and whenever have you, they have you ever had a, a regressive hypnosis no and that's 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 one thing that i've um because i was looking through um this book that um that a friend of mine gave me um that i was talking to and um, Wh which book it's, it's called encounters by um there's a book there's a person you should contact okay uh -huh. and just write him his name is dr david jacobs david jacobs jacobs Temple University, Philad yep. Te Temple University, uh -huh. Philadelphia, right. uh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and he's written a book called Private Li uh, Secret Lives, and 
he will know someone in this area for you to contact. There are virtually hundreds of thousands of people who share your experience and they are now patenting these experiences and putting them together and coming up with a story that suggests that, that abductions are going on. It suggests very strongly that this is an alien force that's, that is studying us. Right. And um, it's, it's, it's something you should take a look at uh, because if you look at the evidence of, of um, hundreds of people under hypnosis, they all share part of the same uh, experience. And it's very difficult to say that, it, it, that it's false when so many people, unconnected, come up with stories that are so identical. And no other, no other sequence of dreams or childhood recollections fits together in this pattern. Anyhow, what does it mean? Uh, if you have a problem, maybe you want to talk to Dr. Japes as well. But we have it here today, 82-year-old sex, sexual uh, abductions on UFOs. It's live. I don't know what's coming up, but stay tuned. Welcome back. Regarding UFO abductions and out-of-body experiences and after-death experiences, um, I want to remind you that our philosophy, that is not the philosophy of the show, but our philosophy as human beings uh, usually depends upon the things we can see and observe. But just because there is not uh, the human eye's potential for observing light before the red spectrum, there does exist an infrared spectrum, just as there exists an ultraviolet spectrum. There are other ways to see and there are other ways to perceive and things are possible that we still cannot even measure, let alone fully understand. So our experience taken all together has to be um, weighed and if you think it's a little wild to consider a, pro uh, a call like that and you want to label a person crazy, I ask you to be patient and just listen, to be open to things. You never know. Don't be prejudiced. Listen. Who do we have? Okay, we have Bobby. She is on line C, and um, sex in the office is causing problems at home. Bobby? Hello, Dr. Jessica. Hi, Bobby. How are you? I'm good. How old are you? I'm 32. Why are you calling? Um, I had sex with um, someone other than my husband. Yes? It, it was someone who works at the same place as I do, and I'm feeling very guilty. When did this start? Um, well, I've known this person at work for maybe eight months, and... And how long have you been having sex? Uh, we, just one time. And has it stopped? I mean, I mean, is the relationship still going on? Uh, I would like it to continue. So how guilty could you be feeling? Well, I'm married, and so is he. Yeah, but I mean, how guilty could you be feeling if you'd like the relationship to continue? How, uh, please help me with that. Okay, um... It's not what I wanted to do, but I wanted it. Why? Uh, because my husband left, and, uh... When did he leave? Uh, about four months ago. Why? Uh, because of another one. So he's not in the house? No. So wait a sec. Bobby, yeah. you've got to be open. You're not being open with me. I mean, the thing you're telling me is that your husband took off with another woman. Right. You've been let, left in the lurch. Mm -hmm. and, you've, and you're falling in love with someone else. Right. Is this other guy married? Uh, yes, he is. So uh, you're doing the same thing to someone else that someone did to you, right? I didn't mean for it to happen, but it just did. Yeah, well, it's also giving you a feeling of control, too, huh? You were out of control before this. Mm, no, I, I don't think so. You don't think so? What do you think the situation was at home? Well, the situation with this other man, um, at that moment, I didn't want it to happen. 
I understand. But the fact is, what is it you feel guilty about? Cheating on him, on his wife, or cheating on your husband? Both. What do you feel worse about? Uh, probably cheating on my husband. Why? Because I've never done anything like this before. I understand, but there's also something going on there that's a little strange, right? Yeah. Okay. What is the relationship with you and your husband like right now? Um, well, he says he wants to come home, but... Do you believe him? Uh, in a way, I do. But do you want him I, home? Uh, do you want I'm not him sure. Home? Okay. And what do you tell him? I don't want to tell him about this relationship. But do you tell him you want him home or not? Um, on occasion, but not very often. Okay. Do you, do you mean it when you tell him? At the moment, I say it, yes, I do mean it. Okay. You, but overall, do you mean it? Do yes. You, you do? Yes, I think I'd like this relationship to work. Okay. Are you willing to do anything about it? Uh, only if he's willing. Is he? Uh, he says he is, but... You don't believe His actions are totally So he, he, he's still seeing the other woman, in other words? Yeah. Okay. So that means that's not going to take place, right? He's not sincere. Right. Okay. So do you tell him that? No. Okay. Um, one of the things that's clear is that the communication between you and your husband is poor. Okay, do you, you see that, right? Yes, we recognize that. Right. Have you thought of the possibility of talking to a therapist together? Oh, I've just ended therapy. I may start again soon. When did you just end? Uh, a couple weeks ago. And when did you start that therapy? Uh, I, I think I had, um, had my limit set of visits as far as my insurance goes. Yeah, but when did you start it was the question. Uh, when all this happened when my husband left. Okay, so, the, the, and what, had, what was therapy about? What did you decide? What, what did you think about? I mean, what was therapy all about? Um, well, my therapist and I, excuse me, we talked, and... What did you decide? My decision at the end of therapy was that I would like to try to make this relationship work. Okay, but you need some help if that's going to be. And um, you need to, look, you need to sit down with your husband. And you need to be straight with your husband. You need to say, someone else has come into the picture in my life. I don't want to talk about it. But someone else is still in the picture in your life, and you don't want to give that person up. If you want to make this relationship work, I will give up the person I'm with if you give up the person you're with, and we both work it out with a couple therapists. Otherwise, this is going to go nowhere, and we are just going to spend time until one of us breaks away permanently. And besides that, nothing much else is going to happen. The way it is with these things. Who's up? Okay, next call. We have Scott. He's on line B. And um, he's got some questions about decisions for his future. Scott, how old are you? Hello, uh, Dr. Viscott. Hi. How old are you? I'm 26. Okay. Decisions about your future. Right. Well, like the little promo said, uh, my problem is that... I, I didn't see the promo. Oh. Well... I don't uh, see the promo incident. Never? No. Oh. Well, I, uh, sometimes I see it, sometimes I don't. But usually I don't. Oh, okay. Well, uh, to sum it up, the problem is is that I am clearly attracted to men. Attracted to or in a homosexual lifestyle? Well, no. Um, I, I'm not in a homosexual lifestyle, although I, I once was. And when did you stop? Uh, about five years ago. Well, let me back up a little bit. Maybe I'll be a little more clear. Okay. When I was about 17, I came out of the closet to my parents and told them I was gay. And uh, as far as I was concerned, that's, that's what it was. And I used to go with my friends to West Hollywood all the time, and, and we had fun. But about four years later, when I was about 21, I was constantly depressed, and I was constantly looking for something else. And... It was about that time that um, I made a decision that something in my life had to change. 
And I had always and have always been attracted to families. I don't mean sexually. I mean... I understand. Okay, good. Uh, I have always been deeply attracted to family and family lifestyle, uh, especially when the father is a strong, loving person and the rest of the household seems to work in order when, when the father seems to be well balanced. And that always attracted me. And it was about that time that I made a decision that I could not find that kind of family environment in the gay world. And so I made a decision that I was going to join a church, which I did, and basically to hope that somehow these feelings would either go away or be assaged over a period of time. Did they? No. <laughs> Are they not the, at all. They're the same level they were before? Yes. I mean, I'm not, I'm not 21, so maybe libido-wise it's not quite the same, but, but the attraction is still definitely there. And attraction to women? Um, I'm attracted sometimes to women, but, but I, I mean, definitely if I compare the two, there's a, a clear difference. And the difference is what? The difference is, is that when I, when I look at a, a man's body, there's a certain type of man that I find attractive, um, good-looking, muscular, um, and there, it's not so much, Dr. Viscott, that I really want to have sex with him because I have had some homosexual sex in the past, and it, it, for me it's not been fulfilling. But that I so much want to have their physical characteristics, to, to feel like that kind of muscular, big man. And that's, that's always been the way I felt. And I've always felt like uh, somebody on the outside looking in. And when I see a, a muscular man or an athletic man, it's just like, I want to be him. I want to get out of this body that I have, which is very overweight, and become him and become manly and be out in the world and, and do things. Um, sometimes I, I'm really not sure whether my problem so much is, is homosexuality, but, but rather feelings of feeling inferior, and somehow I sexualize them, which I suppose has some truth to it. But what I, what I do feel and what really does concern me is I am one of those people that I don't deny that I am sexually attracted to men. Um, but my values are different. I really do love the idea or the thought of being a family man, having a wife and having little children running around and romping around. And, and just the thought of being a father and a husband is something that I truly cherish. Yet have, you, have you dated at all? Yes, I've dated a couple times. Have you met anyone that you like? Um, I don't, no, no. Uh, anyone that you're attracted to? I don't think I've, I've had the, either the confidence or the wherewithal to be able to be in a position like that. What, my, do, you, what do you mean? I mean well, so my dating experience, um, the, the limited amount that I've had, I thought was, was pretty terrible. Can, if I, can I give you an example? Sure. Um, I dated this, this one girl, and I'll never forget, we went to this, uh, it was called a Greek Orthodox festival. They have it like in April or something, and you go and eat lots of food and dance and stuff. And I remember as we were walking into this, uh, this place, there, there were so many uh, men around. And I noticed as I was holding her hand, I couldn't help but to look at these men. And the feeling of being sexually attracted to this men was, was amplified, I think, in part because I, I was also trying to deal with her. And, and I felt so deceptive. And I thought, I, I cannot do this to any woman. Well, I, there, I, let me, let's take a look at, look at the, the truth. The truth is you spend five years trying to answer this question to your own satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in that five years, you've dated how many different women? Uh, two. Which is not a fair, a fair shot. No. No. And if you're really interested in having a family, I think what you ought to do is try to date a lot of women. Well, Dr. Viscott, I, I think the, the problem with that is is that 
I simply don't seem to be attracted to women. I mean, I have a, a then desire. Then what is, what is the situation? The situation is that I am definitely attracted to men. I, 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 but you want a family. But I want a family at the same time. Right. I am what is called, I don't know if you've heard the term, it's fairly new, but a non-gay homosexual. I know this. Yes. And there are people who treat non-gay homosexuals. And I'm seeing one of them. <laughs> okay, and how long have you been in therapy? I've been in about two months. And have you had any, any luck? You know, I've had an interesting experience. Um, one, of the, one of the keys to, to recovery, and, and I don't mean in terms of a disease, but I don't know what else to call it for myself, but I had an interesting experience as I've tried being with other healthy men and to try to feel whatever good things come from being in a, in a healthy environment with other men, is that I have noticed that there seem to be spontaneous times where I am literally all of a sudden attracted to women. Now, I don't force it, but it, it just happens. And, and I, know, I know that happened because uh, it was the most... That's very promising. Yes, it is. My concern, though, is this, Dr. Viscott. Yeah, what, what is that now? Because where you are is all the stuff you've known before you spoke to me. And what we could say, in all honesty, is that some progress is being made. You still have the attraction to men, which goes along with that. But? But I don't really know what to do in order to find other healthy men to be around. I'm, I seem to really find Where did myself. you find the first healthy men? Well, they are actually, they are also uh, non-gay homosexual men um, who are trying to recover as well. And it, it just happened that we, they just came over to my place and we were watching TV and we were just laughing and having... Uh, do, do you have, are you with them in a group relationship? Well, uh, we actually met in a group. I mean, is there a possibility of establishing that group and bringing them back? I am trying to. I am trying to. Well, that would seem like a, like a positive experience for all of you. And if it was possible to bring them back and settle that, set that up, I think that would be one of the areas where you could magnify the feeling. And all of you could talk about it openly together because you wouldn't have to be deceptive. And it would be a way of diminishing the sexual attraction between you. I agree with you. I agree with so you. So why don't you do that? You may, be, well, you may be setting up, for example, one useful adjunct to the therapy in treating non-gay homosexuals. And if that's true, you may be creating a system that, that uh, you could become involved in as part of a therapeutic modality. Uh, it's interesting that you say that because just today I spoke with one of my church leaders uh, about setting up a group, mm -hmm. which... Uh, actually, he didn't seem too interested in, but uh, maybe I can change his mind. <laughs> Whether he's interested or not, you know the following. You know it works for you. You know it's a strong way of making your feelings about women happen. You know it's an adjunct to therapy. You know it's helpful for other men who have the same goals, and it's a way of talking about them and amplifying them, and whether you get support from this person or not, to tell you the truth, that's where I would go, and that's what I would try to reestablish. Do you want to take a call, folks, or should we take a break? Well, we're going to take a break. It's as easy as that. Welcome back. And um, we had a big earthquake again a few moments ago in Northern California. I didn't mean to predict it or anything like that, but there seems to be a swarm of them. I wonder what it all means. Here we go. Okay. Welcome to California. <laughs> okay, let's take uh, Bonnie. She's on line four, and she still wants her boyfriend back even if he has violent tendencies. Bonnie. Yes. How old are you, Bonnie? 31. You're so anxious. Yeah. Why, why, are you, why are you anxious? 
Oh, I've been waiting a long time to get to talk to you. Okay. Well, here you are. What's going on? Oh, I met this this guy um, at Thanksgiving when I went to Catalina for a, a vacation. And um, I, um, I spent a lot of time with him then. My son and I did. And um, he came over to visit me. Uh, in December, and we thought everything was going along okay, and felt pretty good about it. And then I went um, back to um, my family at Christmas time for about a month, and we kept in touch by telephone. But then he started like saying things like he felt insecure, and he wasn't sure about being in a relationship with a woman. And then when I came back in January. I went out to see him. He lives in Catalina. I went out to see him, and at first he was a little ticked off at me. And, um, well, he'd left a message on my machine the night before that he knew I was coming and that I shouldn't waste my time in coming. But I felt like I needed some answers, and so I went ahead Ans and went. Uh, answers to what? Well, why he was feeling insecure or why he didn't think our relationship would work when... Um, we had really clicked it. He, he said it was something personal. He wasn't ready. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. But I felt that there was more to it than that. What did you think? Well, he had been in a relationship. This was a couple of years ago where he had lived with a, a, a girl that he really cared a lot for. And when it came down to the end, um, she had, I mean, more or less really kind of used him um, and really didn't care for so him. So he, he didn't trust women terribly much? No, no, he okay. didn't. So what was the problem? Um, he, he said, well, when I went over there in January, he said he was an alcoholic. And I said, well, you know, I can accept that, and, and that can be dealt with. That's okay. And he said, well, he just felt like there were, he needed to work on himself personally that um, he's saying he doesn't want to be in a relationship, right? Yeah, well, he okay. said he's insecure about himself, and he said he needs to work through these things before yeah. he can share his life with All right. somebody. Why didn't you take him at face value on those comments? Well, because w from our past, we had just, you know, we had just really clicked together, and we had talked about getting but married I and know, what we wanted. But that's two months of a relationship in the honeymoon phase. And he's telling you that he's having a lot of bad feelings, a lot of insecurities, and you're not taking him, pers taking him seriously. Why aren't you taking him seriously? Well, because um, Karen, who's the, the manager where he works that he's confided in, you know, was saying how, or had told me how Jackie had told him what he really felt. And um, Why would he be telling you a different story? Well, I think because he's afraid of being abandoned. That may well be, but what he's telling you is he's afraid of this relationship. All right? That's a very important thing. Because if he's telling you in confidence that he is not comfortable with the relationship, and, and I take it you're persisting and pushing, be honest. Well, maybe a little bit. A little bit. Then he may, he may be feeling that he's getting trapped in the relationship. What happened? Well... I mean, so when I went there, I mean, we had a good day we spent together. We had we had a good time, and by the end of the night, you know, I mean, it was like he seemed real happy, and, you know, what like happened? things were going to work. I don't know. He went Tell back, me what happened. He went back to his room the next morning, and when he came back to talk to me, it's like, well, he had told me he had had a good time yesterday, and... Um, Something happened. What happened? Well, Get to the, then he turned. He just totally, I mean, it was in one breath he was saying he was glad I came, and in the next breath he just, like, said, you know, I lied or this or that, and it's not going to work, and um, get the heck off the island. And what else did he do? Well, um, you know, he just got mad, and then it was a month later when I came back, and I didn't come back to see him. I just come back to enjoy the island because I had come there a long time before he had. And, okay. Um, he, I had come into the office to talk to him because he had treated me badly. Where I met him was at work, and he had treated me badly when it was just Go he ahead. was at work. He was at work. He would see that as you coming out to the island to pester him. Well, no, yeah. That's how he would see it. Well, that's how he. He's but that's it. but the fact that you didn't you didn't think to think of that 
is what is so upsetting to me because this is a man who's telling you he wants to be away from you he doesn't want to be in this and yet you persist why did you persist well i didn't go to the island to see him that's not true i took my little that's not true come here that's not true just admit it to me well, i mean it's too late to, to hide you have to say the truth you went to that island with a specific pro thought in your head of maybe I'll go to the maybe I maybe right. You had the maybe packed with your bags, right? Just well, a, possibly because I mean definitely, I or felt. else you would. Of course. So you went there specifically to find out how he really felt, right? Yeah. Okay. So you went there specifically to see him, right? I don't feel that. I, do I that. feel that way. He felt that way. Okay? So he would feel bugged by you. Look, I have no problem with you. I have no problem with him. I have a problem with the fact that you don't know your own feelings. You felt rejected. You felt confused. And more than that, you felt wounded and desperate. Right? Not particularly. Then why did you pursue him so strongly? Why couldn't you allow him to say, well, I don't want to be involved with you, and you say, hey, time of day, you have it, I'm leaving. You couldn't do that. Okay, so what happened on the island after, you, after he felt pressured by you twice? Well, he, um, he got mad. What did he do? He um, blew up at me. And, and what did he do? He, he took a knife out of the kitchen in the office and held it at my chest. And said? And said nothing. And, and, and acted as if? Well, he was mad at me, but then... For what? Because I told him that when I was a customer and he was at work, he needed to separate his personal feelings from his job and treat me just the same no, as any other customer. No, no, no. Bonnie, come on. You've got to wake up. This is reality. You are forever Barney to him. You're never going to be a customer to him. To go in and pretend that he should react to you like a customer when he felt pressured by you. Maybe he's in love with you and can't handle the feelings. Maybe he's not in love with himself and can't love anyone else, and you bring that to the surface. Maybe he's an inadequate person who was, who was lost his trust in women from this other relationship, and now that he feels being dragged in again, the last thing in the world he wants is to be caught in your web and now you're coming out again to see him and you go into his shop and he's panicking don't you see it doesn't have it to do with you let me tell you the first thing the worst thing in the world that could happen to you right now is that you get off the 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 phone talking to me and your phone rings and it's him and Catalina saying hey I think we should try again this man is completely wrong for you And you're wrong for him because you don't take his feelings seriously. You don't believe in him. And the truth is, because you don't believe in his feelings, you're going to end up hurting him on his scale of, of things the way you were hurting him because he, he only reacts with anger when he feels hurt. And you wouldn't even know how you were doing it. Accept that it's gone, accept that it's over, and don't go to Catalina. He'll know you're in the island the moment you step off the ferry. Sometimes you just have to let these things go, and this is one of those times. You cannot be around someone who's threatening you like this, who's giving you every signal in the world that this isn't going to work. We're going to be right back. You stay tuned. It's good stuff coming up. Welcome back, David Viscott, and this is um, at night, huh? It is at night. It is at night. And we're having aftershocks. I know, big ones. And, you know, relationships have aftershocks. I mean, the, the big ones. Well, <laughs> well, the thing about this woman that made me, you know, Bonnie made me, uh, you know, a, a woman like Bonnie is the type of woman who gets 
into trouble because you cannot read the danger signals that, um, that certain kinds of men give off. There are some men who don't want a close relationship. Although they want it and they claim they do and they bring women in close, the fact is as soon as they find themselves becoming needy, they hate the weakness and the vulnerability that that neediness brings out and they want to push the woman away. And when the woman keeps on coming closer, they don't know what to do about it. And that's what happened with this man, very unstable. Very and, for, and for her to say she went to Catalina without no, w w not to see him and then demands when she comes into his business that he treats her she like... She was in the neighborhood. Yeah, it, but she wants him to treat her like a customer. Not going to work. Well, it's not. It's not. Well, in the, not in this lifetime. Something that you said too, though, was that uh, she couldn't see it. Is it that she couldn't or she wouldn't? No, but that's the whole thing. It's that she will believe that that she was just dropping in, and, and but the point is, if if the maybe is part of your plan, the maybe is the motivation for your plan. Who's next? Okay, we have Phil. He's on line 11. Phil is a former child molester, and he's having some doubts about things. Phil? Yeah, hi, Doc. How you doing? I'm good. Have we ever spoken before? No, we never have. How old are you? I'm 47. Well, I'll be 47 in May. Why are you calling? A uh, long time ago, uh, I went to prison for child molestation, and... Uh, I'm really having problems. Uh, a lot of things have happened in my life that have really gone downhill, so I'm super depressed. Uh, I was molested at the age of three and at nine and at 16 by five men at 16. And then I went to prison for molesting a boy nine years old. And uh, when you're depressed, I guess you uh, start sliding backwards, and I'm really afraid. Uh, I've had to lock myself in my trailer because it's getting that bad. Okay. Why are you depressed? Well, I had an accident in 1990. I've, uh, I had polio when I was three years of age, and I had to be, uh, that's when I was raped, or sodomized. And uh, I was permanently disabled from that time on. My, <clears throat> I had polio on my right leg and my left arm. But I never wanted to stay on Social Security disability all my life, so... Uh, I worked really hard and got a profession going as a, a professional truck driver, owner-operator. But that got to be too strenuous on my uh, right leg and my back. And then in November 17th, 19th, 1990, I had a car accident on the uh, going on the Harbor Freeway uh, the first day of the rain. And my car slid around, and this lady tried to pass me while I was spinning. And... Uh, my hernia, well, I don't know what they call it, herniated or ruptured uh, the first and the second and the fifth and the sixth vertebrae. And I've been fighting with uh, getting SSI and getting SSD. It says right on the SSD record that I'm permanently disabled. If I injure myself again, that I can go right back on it. But they're fighting me all the way, you know, and it's really getting to be hell. I'm tired of fighting everybody. I finally had to go ask for welfare. And it's just going downhill, and, and I've noticed now that I'm, I'm looking at boys again, and I'm going, no, okay. no. When, <laughs> when, when did the, this happen for the first time? Oh, God, I guess uh, I, called, I called here about six or eight months ago. And, uh, this show, you mean? No, I called you, but uh, I couldn't get through. And uh, I finally got enough guts to call you, because I keep watching you every, night, every Saturday. And... Uh, I need help. Uh, I've been to therapy, but I'm, I'm up in a redneck area. Recently? Yeah, I, I, I tried to go up here, but uh, the therapist up here is uh, anti-gay. Uh, and uh, also, I don't make good relationships because I'm, I've got uh, what they call that baby fat, you know, that never comes off a guy's body. And gays only go for muscular people. And you're gay? Yes, sir, I am. And you haven't had any gay relationships? In about uh, 12 years. So it's not the lack of gay relationships that's making you feel this. It's the feeling of powerlessness. Yes. yes. And the feeling of powerlessness in your life makes you wish to have power over something. <sighs> yeah, I guess that's what you'd call it. it. Not so much power over something, but 
God, why doesn't somebody open the door? I've worked hard enough. I've paid my taxes. You know, I've done everything that you're supposed to do in life. What the hell's wrong with the good old USA backing up somebody? Um, is there any chance of you getting therapy in the city out of the area that you're in? I've got no more money. I'm flat busted now, and uh, nobody takes credit. Um, well, how long ago were you in jail? Oh, that was uh, way back in uh, 1969 to 1973. Um, is there any chance of speaking to a probation officer in the court? Oh, no. No, they won't take you after you're off parole. They won't bother with you. Even if you think something could be done to prevent it? Uh, you have to break the law to get the help. That's is what they that told what you, me. Is that what you're trying to do? No, no. No, no. I don't want to go back. Uh, you don't know what it's like in jail. Oh, I'm, I'm uh, aware. Uh, when you hear those doors slam, if I hear a big door slam behind me, I still jump. Uh, I sit in a restaurant. I have to sit where I can see people. I can't have a glass window behind me. I get so paranoid. Yeah. Uh, it's just like somebody's going to shoot a gun at you. No, no, I don't want to go back. Okay, so you definitely need therapy, and we, we're going to help you get some low-cost therapy somehow or other, okay? Okay. Because there's no reason why you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't be able to do this. And so what I would like you to do is I'd like you to stay on the line. Okay. And we'll have s some of the people in, uh, pick up in one of the producers and, and, uh, and, and put you in touch, okay? All right. All right. But the important thing, the most important thing is that you've recognized it. Say that again? You've recognized it. You brought what? it to the surface. You know what's going on. You're feeling out of control, and it's the feelings of being out of control that remind you of all the times when you were sodomized and, and raped as a child. And those forces, the early forces in your life, were the nuggets that caused you to want to repeat that act. So as you feel out of control, you're remembering an earlier feeling of being out of control. And that's really what's pushing all this to the surface now. So let's try to get you into some more control and get you the help you need. You stay on there. And you stay tuned because we're going to be right back following this. Mm -hmm.